Thank you, Arpi. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Congratulations to the organizers and the co-sponsors for another invigorating day of talks by up-and-coming graduate students in Armenian studies. This colloquium has become the centerpiece of the Armenian studies world over the last two decades, serving as an annual marker of a series of diverse expectations, meeting new scholars in the making, learning about cutting-edge research and trends in the field, providing critical and productive feedback, catching up and networking with colleagues, socializing, of course, and for those of our, us who were part of the colloquium's inception and trajectory in this beautiful campus and in these very halls, it is a nostalgic tribute to the gravitas of UCLA, its faculty, graduate students, staff, and alumni for their pioneering work in Armenian studies. Though I'm now leading Armenian studies at USC, I am and will always be immensely proud of my UCLA origins and homeland. I remember from my two decades of organizing, participating, and attending the colloquium that by this point in the day, we are all looking forward to stretching our legs and enjoying the food and company at the reception, so I will keep this brief-ish and straightforward. I have two main aims for this talk. First, to share some reflections on the field, its trajectory, development, and prospects. And second, some practical advice I wish someone had given me while I was still in grad school. The field of Armenian studies has had a very long and fascinating history, starting with linguistics and philology as major centers of focus, often in the examination of ancient religious and historical texts, or for the advancement of comparative Indo-European linguistics. It then developed through various aims and actors. If we take Armenian studies in the US, for example, we see that various communities invested immense foresight and resources um, in the case of Nasser, Bruce is here, 3,000 community members made contributions for the chair in Harvard. This was a unique singular case in the history of chairs in the United States. So, and of course, taking advantage of the post-World War II burgeoning of area studies in American universities, these communities uh, did all of this work to endow chairs that would, for example, bring knowledge of Armenian culture to the wider public, support genocide recognition, prevent diaspora assimilation, and further Armenia's national or political goals. Though all of these are understandable aims, in this process, what was forgotten and omitted is that Armenian studies has intrinsic academic value, as it is, in the broadest sense, the scholarly reflection on Armenia and the Armenian people, this according to Robert Thompson. It is certainly no longer limited to just language and philology. We have witnessed in this trajectory the prof professionalization of Armenian history, language, and literature, the legitimization of Armenian history, and moreover, the legitimization of the study of contemporary issues. Like the research institute I lead at USC, the study of the contemporary Armenian experiences informs and is informed by not only history, language, and literature, but also political science, anthropology, sociology, social psychology, international relations, economics, sociolinguistics, and so much more. We see at some point, according to Jiraj Nivaridian, and I quote, a silent struggle between those who on the one hand wanted Armenian studies as a vehicle of confirmation of identity and reconfirmation of what we knew already by birth, but now had footnoted in a book and thus received the accolades of the community, and those who, who, on the other, wanted to go beyond that and question accepted wisdom and accepted discourse. This is worth pondering. I'm providing all this context to emphasize the following exhortations. Whatever your entry point was to Armenian studies, whatever the original aims were, whether it was infused with patriotic fervor, a search for identity or grounding, or simply intellectual curiosity. Armenian studies cannot be a side passion project that complements the real work you do in the real world. Armenian studies requires and demands the rigor, professionalism, high standards, and excellence as any other discipline or career. It must be all-encompassing, all-consuming, all-demanding, and hopefully all-rewarding. As interdisciplinary as Armenian studies has always been, and as interdisciplinary as the academic ecosystem is in the current arena, 
I dare to make several demands of anyone willing to engage with the field. A firm grounding in Armenian studies is non-negotiable for anyone who pursues Armenian studies. Rigorous training in Armenian language, preferably all three standards, Armenian history, literature, and intellectual thought must undergird every Armenian studies scholar. It is unfathomable to think or assume otherwise. The thorough preparation in Armenian studies must be accompanied by intense training in research methodologies and theories. These need to be strategically selected and pursued based on the related disciplines you are working in now or see yourself working in the future. This too is non-negotiable so that Armenian studies work does not simply dwell in the realm of the descriptive but enters the analytical. I would take it a step further and implore that you do not, for example, be limited or satisfied with plugging in an Armenian case study into an existing theory or experiment relevant for your field. Dare to challenge the theory or experiment, its design, its presumed units of analysis, its aims, its formulation. Dare to shape the field. Dare to reconstruct the discipline you are engaging with to produce more inclusive or more effective tools for social and cultural analysis. If there is anything we know about the history of area studies in the US is that one, it has always been interdisciplinary, two, it has represented a major social intervention that has deparochialized US and Eurocentric visions of the world, generated new knowledge and new forms of knowledge, and denaturalized the formulations and universal universalizing tendencies of Western disciplines which continue to fashion analyses based on particular histories, structures, power formations, and selective or often idealized narratives. Next, get used to your double identity as an armenologist and something else, a political scientist, an anthropologist, a historian, a linguist, a sociologist, and get used to packaging yourself as necessary in various contexts and for different opportunities. At the same time, challenge any notion that denigrates you or your work as deriving from external, more political agendas, and thus less intellectually legitimate and lower status in the university community. Finally, you will find yourself under constant coercion from administrators and market forces that prompt you to prove your work useful as universities shift toward market-driven majors. You must believe that humanities have intrinsic value not measurable by contemporary utilitarian standards. All this hinges on our courage to reject the assumption that value and utility are synonymous. Now onto pragmatic advice and wisdom I wish I had been given and that I have accumulated over the years, which I'm going to generously share with you today. <laughs> Appreciate and own your status as a graduate student particularly for those who matriculate to doctoral programs right after the bachelor's degree, it may be difficult to cast off the role of the perennial undergraduate student. Step out of that shell and understand that you are already part of a very small and exclusive community of researchers who are doing demanding work. Take every opportunity to present and publish your work and engage with the work of others. Take your work, your time, and your role seriously. Invest in languages, obviously all the Armenians, but also related and research languages as well. Don't look at them as chores or hurdles to get you to your end goal. They are the means, the keys, the codes to worlds and worldviews that await your engagement to algorithms that will connect everything you do. As Professor Cowie once said during a particularly difficult translation in our advanced Gedalpaj class, when all three of us in the cohort gave up on trying to make sense of the passage, the author is trying to communicate something to you. Figure it out. <laughs> when reading books, don't immediately skip to the introduction or the meaty content chapters. Take the time to read the preface, the editor's note, and the acknowledgments. These will reveal and recount the behind the scenes processes and trajectories that led to the birth of the particular project and the development of the author. These things matter. Talent is nice to have, but in reality quite insignificant. I know a lot of talented ruins. What matters most is diligence, stamina, and a growth mindset. Never rely on talent. 
Always push forward with faith in your work ethic and discipline. Step out of your narrow niche and go to talks, conferences, and workshops in related and unrelated disciplines. It may surprise you how eye-opening and liberating it can be. Be ready for the coincidental, accidental, happenstance meetings, readings, conversations, and ideas that may define your trajectory. Though my expertise now is in heritage languages, it was all born from seeing a flyer on a heritage language teaching workshop and embarrassingly Googling the word because I didn't know what heritage language meant. Learn to say no, but also understand the hidden doors that open when you willingly, hesitantly, or under pressure to perform free labor, say yes. Those doors will lead to invisible windows that may provide the air you didn't know you needed desperately. No one, not your best friend, not your partner, not your spouse, your parents, your kids, your cousins, your uncles and aunts who wonder if you're writing an autobiography will understand the trauma and difficulties of going through grad school unless they've gone through it themselves. No one can comprehend why it took you four and a half hours to compose an email to your committee because you were trying to find that perfectly fine balance and tone so that you sound confident but not demanding, demanding but not insolent, urgent but not whiny, knowledgeable but not deferential, deferential but not a pushover, you get the point. No one outside of academia will understand that you spent eight hours sitting in front of a screen to write an abstract, of which five and a half were spent reading other work, often completely unrelated to the topic at hand, two were spent on social media breaks to rejuvenate your thoughts, 45 minutes on constant coffee refills, a few minutes asking yourself what is my purpose in life, and then a crowning 10 minutes during which you wrote, this study will explore the nuanced dynamics of. And after all this, you deemed it an exceedingly successful writing session. No one will understand the toll graduate school can take on your self-esteem because it takes you from the version of you that felt like the smartest and most accomplished person in the world when you received the acceptance letter to your program to feeling increasingly less smart, less competent, less confident less certain about anything, and less grounded under the constant demands and scrutiny of academic rigor and volume. Because of the potential isolation and toll of graduate school, you need to find your people in academia, and they may come from the most surprising and unexpected corners. Make friends with other grad students and form writing groups. Develop social relationships with other faculty and staff on campus, Departmental administrative assistants are a lot of fun and know all the juicy gossips. <laughs> Organize regular check-ins, also known as happy hours, where you vent, share horror stories, cry, and laugh with each other. Some of those conversations will be formative in your intellectual development, but also your social and mental well-being. Find your people and hang on to them. Be kind to yourself, to your body, and to your mind. Continued stress and anxiety can take a serious toll on you psychologically, physiologically, and socially. As non-consequential as this may sound, when facing a particular moment of doom, make sure you get yourself outside, take a walk, stand under the sun, go for a hike or a swim. The world will look brighter. Seek the support you need and stay physically active. Develop a good, healthy relationship with your advisors, setting realistic expectations. I don't know who all your advisors are, but I can say several things for certain. Your advisor does not go to sleep or wake up thinking about you. Your last email, your last chapter, or that embarrassing slip of the tongue you made during the last meeting. They have their own work, looming or missed deadlines, unanswered emails, political dynamics at work, family demands, and anxieties they are dealing with. You are one of myriad responsibilities they are handling or mishandling. When you get in their office, make the most of it. When you show up during spring break or winter break and they are late or have simply forgotten that meeting, respond firmly but have some grace. Do not in any way attribute that to their assessment of your value or work. When you reach out for a letter of recommendation and the deadline is approaching, send a gentle reminder instead of spiraling under the assumption that they do not want you to make progress. Most importantly, look to them for mentorship, guidance, advice, and strength. But remember, you and only you are your most important and best champion. Invest in yourself, in your well-being, your growth, and your development. 
the return on investment is quite high and personal. Remember, as Yona Sabar told me during my dissertation defense, you are the expert in your topic. Your advisors and committee members may be celebrated senior scholars, but no one has the expertise and knowledge on your research because no one has the intimate interaction, engagement, appreciation, frustration, abhorrence, and obsession with your little contribution to the larger pool of knowledge. So when it comes to your defense, understand you have the best command of the material and everybody else wants to make sure they have something to contribute. Imposter syndrome is real. If you haven't experienced it, most likely you will. We all have it, we all live with it, we all need to learn to deal with it. Talk to your peers and mentors about it. You will immediately feel better when they share their experiences. If you are fortunate, they will also give you some amazing tricks, like wear red lipstick when you're writing, it works for some people, or narrate your work in a British accent, it makes you feel smarter. You will learn to manage it over time. I assure you there is evidence to suggest that imposter syndrome correlates with success. The dissertation is not your masterpiece. As my advisor Olga Kagan told me, it is simply proof that you can join the club we call Doctors of Philosophy in Academia by proving that you can do this kind of work. It does not define your status or potential in the club. It is simply the entry ticket. With that in mind, repeat the following over and over again. The best dissertation is a done dissertation. Be like Nike, just do it. <laughs> We in academia are fortunate and privileged to work and live in the world of ideas, in the aspirational universe of theories and concepts. Sometimes after soaring in the ethers of the abstract, it may be difficult to descend to the often drab realities of the concrete or of the mundane day-to-day -day of the ever-growing responsibilities of our real-world existence. To this I say, invest in your relationship with your closest people because they are the ones who have dealt with your ups and downs, your glories, as short-lived as those may have been, and frequent meltdowns. They are the ones who have picked up the slack while you were busy adding knowledge to the world that very few people understand. They are the ones that have had blind faith in you and your potential. Make sure to express how grateful and appreciative you are. As Jonas Sabar also told me once, you cannot hug a dissertation. It does not keep you warm at night. Your relationships are what will get you not only through grad school, but the more complicated landscape that comes afterwards. Do not assume that you cannot pursue personal growth or build a family while in grad school. One of the most life-changing pieces of advice I received from, was from Masha Polinsky, otherwise known as the godmother of heritage language studies, who said with a huge smile on her face as I explained a bit cautiously that I already had a three-year-old daughter in my fourth year of grad school, that grad school is the best time to have kids. You are not bound by the eight to five chains of a full-time job that prevents you from having a flexible schedule. Nothing will make you more efficient in managing your time, your priorities, and your tasks as having a child that depends on you and adores you, regardless of your imposter syndrome, meltdowns, and everything else. And finally, when you graduate, perform acts of appreciation to your people, and then take the intentional time and effort for a glory tour. Visit every family member who has asked in confusion why you're still in school at age 30 with your, di with your diploma. <laughs> Maybe even suggest that they start addressing you with Duke. <laughs> Visit all the places you used to work from and sit and do nothing or read for pleasure. Look around and realize that you never noticed the art on the walls or the cacti in the courtyard, the cracked tiles in the restroom or the record collection in the corner because you were too anxious about your work. Take it all in because this will last all of one to two weeks before you get bored and notice the itch to work. Get to it, now you're on the other side. Thank you so much.